In 2011, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Okuma, Japan was hit with an earthquake and a tsunami, resulting in three nuclear meltdowns, three hydrogen explosions, and the spread of a whole bunch of nuclear radiation to places where radiation is not supposed to go. Now, you might think that they got that situation all sorted out, since the world has since had at least three other bad things happen since then, but they're still out there removing nuclear waste, decontaminating water, and dismantling buildings, and they predict they won't be done until at least 2051. At this point, you're probably thinking, 2051? That's so far away! I'll be able to legally vote by then! But as it turns out, taking 40 years to shut down a nuclear power plant isn't unusual at all. In fact, even in the case of a totally non-tsunami nuclear power plant, the decommissioning process can take up to 60 years, with a lot of plants spending more time being shut down than they did actually operating. So why exactly does this kind of thing take so long? Well, let's look at three different ways you can decommission a nuclear power plant, which range from pretty timely to you'll be dead, your children will be dead, their children will be dead, and several more generations of children will be dead before this process is actually complete. The first, and by far the fastest way to shut down a plant, is a process called decon, or immediate dismantling, and it still takes, at minimum, seven years to complete. That's what happened in Vermont when the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant couldn't keep up with natural gas prices and shut down in 2014. Now, dismantling this building was a little more complicated than taking a wrecking ball to a haunted Chuck E. Cheese, and that's largely because it was radioactive. You can't just scrap everything and haul it off to a dump somewhere else in Vermont, lest you end up with the worst superhero of all time. So the first thing that usually happens in the decon process is the creation of a radioactivity map of the entire facility to identify where things are radioactive and how radioactive they are. Because to make matters more complicated, radioactive waste, which in the case of a decommissioned nuclear power plant is pretty much every single object on site, has to be categorized into one of three levels of radioactivity, and each category has different rules on how it can be handled, packaged, and shipped. Some of the more hazardous components, like the core shroud and jet pumps, had to be disassembled and packaged underwater, and many of them could only be loaded onto a train after being put into custom boxes that had shielding specifically designed for the component it was meant to hold, and then those boxes were, in turn, filled with concrete. Rent and repeat for several hundred more tons of equipment, and yeah, this takes a while. But the most difficult thing to move off-site is the nuclear fuel itself, because, you see, nuclear fuel is really good at being hot, and it's really bad at stopping being hot. In order to move the nuclear fuel, it has to be put in a container like this, called a dry cask, but if you just drop the core of an active nuclear reactor into a concrete box and send that box onto a highway, something bad will happen. I'm not sure exactly what, but people a whole lot smarter than me have determined that that is a bad idea. So before the fuel can be moved to dry cask storage and shipped off-site, it needs to be cooled down in a pool like this, and this step alone can take years before the fuel is safe enough to be dealt with. Now, the process I just described is what happens when everything goes perfectly, and that's no fun. So let's talk about some of the options when things go not so perfectly. After shutting down a plant, the company that's running it might go, uh-oh, our nuclear power plant is too radioactive, and or no one wants to take our hundreds of tons of nuclear waste right now, and or we ironically don't have enough money to destroy our own nuclear power plant. This is what happened at the Duane Arnold Energy Center in Iowa, which had to be shut down after getting damaged in a storm, forcing them to go with option two, safe store, or deferred dismantling. This involves taking the fuel out of the plant and then just letting the whole thing rot for the next 30 to 50 years before finally coming back and actually dismantling things. This is actually a pretty common thing to do. Right now, there are 11 nuclear plants in the US alone that are in this state of nuclear level procrastination. But what's the point? Well, for one, a lot of the radiation will dissipate in those three to five decades, making everything a lot easier to deal with. But two, the company running the plant will have a lot more money to work with. At least in the US, when building a nuclear power plant, you have to create a trust fund for the sole purpose of decommissioning the plant when it's useless and ready to retire, which, as is the case with most trust fund recipients, is often far sooner than originally hoped. So if the trust fund isn't big enough to cover costs when the plant gets shut down, these extra 30 to 50 years should do the trick. And that brings us to our final option called Intune, or nuclear entombment. In this process, the facility will be sealed and covered in anti-radiation shielding, and then the entire thing will be filled with cement and left to sit forever. Basically, think of this as the nuclear equivalent of just shoving all your trash in the closet and then filling the whole thing with cement. It's not ideal, but it's sometimes necessary. Entombment really only happens when there's been a disaster, or if there's very little money on hand, and even then, it's usually only partial entombment. One of the few examples of this is in Nebraska, where the Hallam nuclear power facility was only able to operate for two years in the 60s before everything started breaking, and they just got fed up and buried the reactor underground. 
Part of the facility is still there, above ground, but all the important stuff is encased in concrete under this field here, which now has to be monitored for radioactivity until at least 2090, but will remain there in its tomb for much, much longer. Full entombment is much rarer, and really only used in cases like Chernobyl, where the situation was so dangerous that all they could do was build concrete walls around it until people stopped dying, which kind of worked but also kind of didn't, and frankly this is the end of the video and I don't want to open that can of worms right now. Uh, anyway, now you know how to decommission a nuclear power plant. I don't know why you needed to know that, but now you do. So get out there and get decommissioning. But also, if you made it to the end of this video about a totally arbitrary bureaucratic process, it means you probably like learning things and hold on, I know you know this is an ad for Nebula, but even if you're already signed up, just hear me out this time because I have something exciting and special and kind of weird to talk about near the end of this ad. Nebula, for those of you who don't know, is a creator-owned streaming service that I started with my friends, some of whom you might already watch, like Real Life Lore and Real Engineering. It's become the home, not just for us, but for so many other creators, for every big, risky project that we've always wanted to create, but could never make on YouTube. With the funding we've gotten from Nebula, we've been able to put out full-length original documentaries like The Colorado Problem, which explores the present and future of the Colorado River, but we've also made some silly stuff like Crime Spree, a game show where I run around the country breaking real laws. Signing up for Nebula not only gets you access to this massive library of original content, but it's also a great way to support independent creators like myself and all of these other folks scrolling by. And that's why, just last week, we decided to temporarily bring back the option to purchase a lifetime membership. We tried this as an experiment a few months ago, as a way to quickly fund some large new projects without having to take money from venture capital firms. It was a massive success. So many of you showed your support, and now we have some really exciting things in the works that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So if you want to support us while we take Nebula to the next level, this is by far the best way you could do it and you'll have access to Nebula for life. Just follow the link in the description or click the button on screen.